Hi. Okay. Oh, people still filing in. You're late. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome everyone to the last talk we have for this year's Reflections Projection. It's been fantastic. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to stop talking and introduce Jay Freeman now. He is better known as Sorik in the jailbreaking community. He's really, really well known for his app Cydia. If you've ever jailbroken anything iOS, you've probably seen Cydia. Uh, he also currently is a new lecturer teaching classes at uh, UCSB in the creative, it's the, what is it, creative studies department? It's <laughs> something like that, but if you ask him about it, he says it's for people who can't stand being bored. So he's going to tell you about the challenges in software modification, and I'm going to be quiet. Jay Freeman, guys. Hello. So uh, is this mic actually on? Or I'm like, it's sort of on. It's sort of on. OK. Right, how's, there we go. <laughs> okay. So, hello. Um, so I'm here. I'm here to talk to you about challenges in software modification. Um, but one thing I always end up doing, uh, despite even when conferences do an introduction of me, I tend to do a quick introduction to myself. Uh, so I'm Jay Freeman, um, but everyone online knows me as Sorik. So I actually, I. I I, I just made these slides today, and I just I always this slide always ends up getting drastically changed constantly, and I'm just I'm, I can't read this. Um, so I grew up near Chicago. Uh, so coming to uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign is uh, actually a, kind of a trip home for me. I end up flying into Chicago and then driving down here. Um, I went to Hinsdale Central High School, although in Urbana you probably have never heard of this, but it's uh, one of the western suburbs of Chicago. As Claire mentioned, I teach computer science at UCSB's College of Creative Studies. Uh, I am a gray hat hacker. So I don't know how many of you here went to, I think his, you pronounced his name, Case's talk earlier today, but he was talking about the difference between white hat and black hat hackers. I think that was him nodding there. Not wearing good glasses either. <laughs> um, uh, the difference between white hat and black hat hackers, I would self-describe myself as a gray hat hacker. And I'm also incredibly disorganized, and so a big apology to Claire and Cole for trying to coordinate me involved in this, this conference. All right, so much like in a movie hackers, right, you got these people who are hacking all sorts of crazy uh, in rave environments. Well, actually, I've done that. Uh, <laughs> it was only a few months ago. Uh, this is always happening behind me. Um, but honestly, I actually spend a lot more time uh, doing what I would call community management. Uh, I go, I give talks at different conferences. I explain what jailbreaking is, why it's important. Uh, I, I do a lot of outreach for the jailbreak community. Uh, the amount of development that I do is actually, at this point, taking a back seat to my attempts to make people understand what jailbreaking is and why, and why it should not be afraid of it, for example. But the application that everyone ends up knowing me for is Cydia. Uh, and that is how my company makes money, is, is the Cydia store system that allows developers to distribute software uh, on jailbroken devices. Now, when I say that, people always get a little confused, and they think that, well, we're that, that place where if you can't get into the App Store, and you always hear all these rejects from the App Store, you go to Cydia, and you distribute your stuff in Cydia. Um, in fact, that's really not what we're about. Um, we're about all these things that aren't apps. So what do I mean when I say that? So there, you know, there's this ad you've probably seen a gajillion times from Apple about there's an app for that, uh, and all these different um, things you can get access to on, on, your, on your phone, all of these different experiences, whether it be um, companies like Yelp providing different ways of searching, whether it be games. Um, what we provide is more features. So I, we have something called the feature store, you might call it, uh, which is Cydia. So what are some features you might have? Winterboard is something else that I develop. Uh, it allows you to have a custom look on your phone. So you can change what all the icons look like. You can change what all of the um, button graphics and switch graphics look like. Um, sometimes it's just new functionality. So here, instead of having four icons at the bottom of my device, I've got five icons. It's a very subtle change, the kind of thing that would be very easy for Apple to make, but it's something that can be very difficult if you're a third party. I mean, clearly, I mean, it's not an app, right? It's like, an app is once you go into one of those icons, it's not something that exists outside of the icon. 
can be kind of crazy stuff too. So here's something called barrel. Um, so as you sweep all the icons across, they all move together, form a rolling uh, circle, and roll off screen, whereas another circle rolls on screen, comes onto the display. It's not just in Spring Bird either, uh, inside of applications. So here's an example of uh, the YouTube application. You, you can add functionality like the ability to download YouTube videos. This downloads button is embedded directly into the YouTube application. Now, kinds of features that we end up seeing are, uh, can be anything. Um, so here's a bunch of new features that are in iOS 8. And I believe that I made this slide purposely so that all of these were ones that we had available on jailbroken devices on iOS 7. Uh, so you can kind of you can imagine now, instead of having to wait for Apple to make a whole new experience where they're going to make a whole new version of iOS, you can go into Cydia, the feature store, and you can kind of piecemeal pick and choose individual features that you want. Right, so how do we do all of this? And this is the kind of thing where people first look at the iPhone and they think, okay, well, you know, how, I know how to, make, how to make modifications to software. Where is the source code? Is, is, it, is any of it open source? In fact, if you go to Apple's website, some parts of uh, iOS's uh, core are open source, but most of it is not open source. Now, we still have the ability to make modifications to things. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But there's some cool aspects of open source is that I mean, you ha if, you, if you have access to the source code, you have the ability to make all sorts of sorts of changes. Um, open source is something that's talked about quite often. Um, and of course, there are many different licenses available for open source. What is open source, right? So open source is the ability to um, get access to the source code from the original vendor, make changes to it yourself, hopefully, be able to redistribute it, et cetera. Um, I bring this up because a lot, of, a lot of times I talk to people, especially people who are just getting involved in the community of software. Uh, maybe they've been learning software in school, such as many of yourselves. And they're not certain about a lot of these different forms of licenses, why they exist, things like that. OK, so a lot of my software is open source. And I generally use a license called GPL, which some people really don't like. And so I'm going to spend a minute explaining why I use GPL and why I think that a lot of the compl uh, complaints about GPL are a kind of a misunderstanding of where GPL is coming from, largely due to people associating um, GPL almost entirely with feelings they have about Richard Stallman. Um, and which is, which is something that I, I think is really unfortunate, because I think that there are a lot of the things that he's been saying are very interesting. Um, but because he's been saying the same thing for a very long time, people don't really listen anymore. Um, they, they, they think of him as a, a broken record, and they, they feel like it's not, it's not, it's not touching their, their experience of software very well. So GPL is a license such that when you make it open source and somebody else uses your code, it virally infects negative terms, right? It virally infects their code and makes their code also GPL. And now the code that has been constructed, a derivative of that code, is also open source and must be so under GPL. OK. People look at this and they think that this is something that is restricting freedoms. That when you are, when, in order to use this software, that is, or when I, as I distribute this software, it is less free than if I use licenses such as the BSD license, where simply distributing the software uh, is by the way, I'm going to stop for a second and say, if anyone is finding any of this horribly confusing, please raise your hand. And I will actually, like, I'm used to teaching class environments. And so if there's something that I'm actually really screwing up here, I'm kind of looking out at the audience. And I would love to answer the question and make certain that everyone actually understands what I'm saying. OK. Uh, so uh, BSD is a license such that um, I distribute the source code. You have access to the source code. If you'd like to make a closed source commercial product out of it, you're still allowed to. That looks like an extra freedom that people have. All right, so my complaint is going to be, I'm going to ask the question, freedom for who? Um, so there are a few people we could be looking at. There's freedom for uh, first party developer. So this is me as the person making the software, distributing it to people, what freedoms I have related to my software. All of these licenses have the property that you can change the license anytime you want because it's your software. So you, you're giving other people a license. So really, this person is kind of irrelevant for this question. Although a lot of people get this confused, and they will look at the um, they will look at um, some of these licenses and think, well, you know, if I distribute it under GPL, then like later on when I want to like use my own source code or something, well, no, it's your source code. You can always take it and redistribute it under whatever license you want. Third party developers. This is the big one, is, is that a lot of people who care a lot about software licenses are developers. And so developers look at other software that's in the ecosystem, and they look at the software and they think, oh, it's a GPL software. That means that I can't use it in certain ways. That's a lack of freedom. But there's another party involved, which are end users. And I will make the point that end users might be developers, but end users might not be developers. And yet there's something really interesting going on with relation to how they use, so use software, which is that if you have free software, which is the term that we utilize for the GPL software, if you have the software that people must continue to require to be open source, when you as the end user get that software on your computer, you have the ability 
guaranteed to modify it, no matter who got their hands on it in the intermediate. So if you, for example, are um, utilizing WebKit, WebKit is open source. But when you actually get WebKit on your device, you actually install Chrome Mobile, the mobile version of Chrome is not open source. And so there are changes in functionality modifications, as is, by the way, the, of course, the mobile version of, of, um, of Safari on iOS. Um, there are changes that you do not have access to. You cannot modify that code. You don't have the ability to understand what that code does. You've lost, as an end user, a lot of the freedoms and abilities that are supposed to have come from the glorious revolution that is open source. Uh, so if you look at, now this is a trade-off. It's a, it's a trade-off between the uh, freedom of the end user versus the freedom of the third-party developer. You can start asking questions about who we care about more in dif different situations. And I will make the argument, and of course this is now very, becomes a very personal argument, that there are many more end users and that I think that their needs are actually more dire than the needs of the third-party developer. Because many of the third-party developers who are trying to utilize the um, BSD software in order to build the closed source commercial, soft commercial components are actually just trying to repackage value constructed by other people and then hoarding value from other people in a way of kind of sitting in the middle in order to extract value from that chain. And that's what GPL is kind of trying to sit and intermediate, making certain that the end user is protected from those middlemen, as interestingly enough, is the first party developer as well. And that person, despite the fact that third party developers shout a lot in all of the arguments, the first party developer is the person who actually has to make a licensing decision in the end. So I, I would like to ask you all to actually consider using GPL licenses. But there is a bug, thank you. But there is a bug, which is that in GPL version two, you could still end up in a situation where the user did not have the ability to modify the software. So if you've got a TiVo, TiVo is built on Linux, it used the Linux kernel, it had a bunch of Linux software running on it, um, and yet, when you got the TiVo device, it was cryptographically verified throughout all of the boot chain, and you were unable to make any modifications to any of the software that was running on it, undermining the whole point. So at some point, the, this, this was realized that this is actually like so problematic that it is kind of undermining the whole mission of, of, of the Free Software Foundation. And so their new version of GPL came out, GPL3, which kind of forces an idea of open hardware. So this is, these are two separate thoughts, but I'm putting them together because I think that it's important to think of GPL3 as the vehicle by which we can try to obtain open hardware, which is that if you, if, if, TiVo was forced to actually build an entire operating system from scratch in order to build, on this, build that device, maybe they wouldn't have. That, or maybe it would suck, and an uh, open hardware com device that was actually utilizing a GPL3 software stack would be able to outcompete it more easily. All right. Now, as I said, though, none of the stuff that we're working on is open source. So how do we make all these modifications? Well, there's, a, there's historical precedent for this. So if you had a Nintendo or a Super Nintendo, or probably none of you did, um, <laughs> the, uh, there was a device called the Game Genie. So when you had any of these kind of cartridge systems, the Game Genie was a cartridge adapter that sat between the system and the cartridge and allowed you to make modifications to the software as it got read from the cartridge. So when you booted up the game console, instead of reading from the cartridge, it would boot up into a game that was the Game Genie. And the Game Genie interface allowed you to dial in codes. You would then get a book of codes from people. And the book of codes would have these hex numbers that you would type. Actually, Game Genie was kind of funny because they had these like letter-based codes trying to make it shorter and easier. But you would dial these codes into the system, and then once you had dialed these codes in, you would start the actual game. And when you started the actual game, every time it read the code from the cartridge to, for example, decrement your life, that would get knopped out, because it got replaced by a knob. Um, or every time you, uh, you would check to see whether you were running or swimming, you're always swimming. And so now you're swimming through the levels where you're supposed to be, um, you're supposed to be running and jumping in your platformer game. This functionality is something that I kind of grew up with, actually, and I just thought was so absolutely amazing and fun and allowed you to take these games that other people had constructed and kind of make them your own thing. What I feel like I've worked on is Game Genie for everything else. So I built a system called Substrate, which is what I actually, when I look at the ecosystem of Cydia, like of all the stuff that we have, um, this is the component that I'm proud of. This is the component that I wish people remembered me for, not the like installer app uh, that, that, I, that I maintain with the ability to distribute software for. So, how does this work? Here's some actual code. All right, so there's a function in the C library, if any of you here have taken introductory networking, there's a function called connect. The connect function takes a socket address and a socket address length. We're going to modify it so that anytime somebody tries to connect to the port 6667, they're gonna to connect to the port 7001 instead. So we're gonna use MS hook function, and we're gonna give it the address of the original connect function, we're going to give it the address of a replacement connect function, and then we're going to give it the address of a pointer to a function, which will get filled in with a new constructed function that if we were to call it, we'll call through to the original. 
All right, so how does this actually play out in the, in the code here? So in our new connect function, um, we're going to check to see, and I, I did this all very, like, very explicitly in order to make certain that I did this correctly. Of course, you could, you could do this much less correctly, but I, I really hate not making things correct. So I'm going to check to make certain very correctly that it's uh, AF INET, and then I'm going to get the address pointer. I have to, um, C allows me to actually do an implicit cast there, so I, you're going to need a warning, but I also need to make the code short. Um, so I'm going to get, a, um, get the address as an internet address. Then I'm going to check to see if the port is 6667. You've got to, of course, do byte swapping on that. Then I'm going to make a copy of the, um, of the uh, value of the socket address. That's why I indirect that, copy it into a new structure. And the reason why I do that is that technically the application might, might notice the fact that I modified their original data, or their original data might not be modifiable. It might actually be like in a read-only block of memory. Uh, again, I'm doing this really irritatingly correct. Uh, and then I'm going to reset the port to 7001 and call the original one. Old connect is a pointer to a function that will call the original function. So I've kind of wrapped the function in a new function, modified its behavior. This makes sense to everyone. All right. Now, we can also do this at the Objective-C level. So Objective-C is, is an object-oriented system that has classes and methods. So here's a class, um, which is the color class. Color has a method on it. Um, methods in Objective-C are hilariously named, like init with red, green, blue, alpha. Um, is the compound com like selector name. Uh, I'm going to take that class, I'm going to take that selector, and then I'm going to give it two pointers again, one of which is a pointer to a new implementation, and one of which is a pointer to the original implementation that I will replace. If any of you here have used Objective-C, this might look a little bit awkward, um, because it's like, well, why have pointers to functions? There actually are functions. I've got this ID and selector. Uh, at the C level of Objective-C, this is what all of the functions look like. Uh, and so now I can call the original one. I'm going to jack up the red, turn down the green, and I'm going to make everything a little bit purple. OK. So I do, I do a lot of purple examples because purple is a really vibrant, high contrast color that even if I have a really broken projector that somebody has at whatever presentation that I'm giving, I can still actually show them that, look, it turned purple. <laughs> OK. So we're going to get more purple examples. Um, here in Java is how I do this in Java. All right, so here again at the C level, I'm going to take um, using J and I, I'm going to get the, and this is this on resources thing, I should wait, I copied this slide, I probably should have deleted that section. Um, so the fact that it's in this function called on resources, just ignore that part. All right, so I'm going to have a get method ID in order to look up the get color method of the Android resources class. I'm going to then call MS Java hook method, and I'm going to pass it my J and I context, my resources class, the method that I just looked up, and again, two pointers to functions. Um, and these two pointers to functions are the J and I C level API version of what those functions are. And it, anyone here is paying enough attention will note that the calling convention is slightly different. Um, one of them has a uh, variadic calling convention, and the other one has the explicit argument. That's just how J and I normally works. And so if you use J and I, that feels natural. And if not, you're like, why? Um, so in my replacement implementation, because that returns an integer with 32 bit color encoding, I'm going to turn off the green, and then jack up the red using uh, an and not and an or, and return the original, uh, return that value. OK, this is all really low level, though. You're like, this is C? Why am I using C in order to hook all this stuff? So we can do the same thing at the Java level. I provide an API, so I can actually, from Java, uh, take my resources class, take my get color method. And so the type I now here is two lines of code I should have included. Um, that get color is a Java lang reflect method. Uh, and then I'm going to pass it an MS method alteration, which, can, which is an anonymous inner class I'm going to quickly construct that has a callback invoked. And I can use the invoke method to call through to the original. Um, there's actually a longer version of this code that feels more like the other pieces of API that we had. But this is the short one that makes it go like, oh, I see how this is actually kind of simple. Well, to the extent to which anything in Java is simple, right? Because I feel like I've got so much boilerplate just in order to have a functor. Um, all right. Now, back to Objective-C then, so well, how do we make this easier in Objective-C? Everyone actually uses something called Logos. And so Logos is a preprocessor that takes something that looks a lot like Objective-C and generates all of the stuff that you see when you normally use Substrate. Uh, so here is how this looks when you're using Logos. Starts to look really easy if you know Objective-C. If not, you're like, this is the weirdest syntax ever. Um, a little bit actually closer to Objective-C, recently I, I provided a feature called MS Hook Interface that allows you to use Objective-C syntax, including the super keyword, in order to do this. No preprocessors, just a bunch of crazy runtime hacks in order to make the super keyword statically resolve to a different class than the one that's actually going to happen at runtime. Um, but this allows you to make these modifications as well. But this is, so this is Substrate. These are, and so I've got Substrate is um, documented on, on Substrate.com. I've got tons of documentation about, uh, with all of these examples. Um, I've got all the different functions available um, and how to use all of them. Um, if anyone has more questions about Substrate, happy to talk about that later. 
But another thing that I developed is something called script. So script is a JavaScript Objective-C hybrid language with a runtime like it, um, uh, my brain's not working, REPL, read eval print loop um, uh, command line interface that you can use in order to manipulate software. So at the base level, it is just a JavaScript console that has fairly good error reporting, live syntax highlighting, um, fairly, good command, fairly good editing features, et cetera, as, which is what I demonstrate here. But I've also gone through and I've bridged C data types uh, in a way that you can use objective C type names and you can use actual C syntax within this at encode block, which is actually some syntax I lifted from objective C, uh, in order to talk about types. So I can make a new type um, using J JavaScript syntax and I get back an at encode. Or I can and I temper this question mark debug is where we're why we're going to get the CY equals in order to see like how the code expands. So I'm going to type at encode. That's going to actually get expanded into JavaScript, which is int.function with int pointer to, which then is going to return an at encode of something that looks normal from a C programmer's perspective. And you can even do type defs, and the type defs are just uh, setting a variable, because the types in script are all just variables. We can then use our types in order to instantiate memory. Um, so I'm going to instantiate a new integer, and I get back the address of a zero. Uh, and then I can go and I can um, look at its type. I can call free. I can just call through that C function. I can indirect my pointer and, uh, and set its value. I can also take that pointer. I can typecast it uh, to different pointer types and then indirect those in order to, for example, see this value. And um, this is a encoded 32-bit IEEE floating point number. Uh, and get it back out as a float. Make sense so far? OK. I, I, I haven't talked to technical audiences in a while, so that's why I'm like, actually, I'm excited that I can like, put a bunch of code up here and actually like, point at it, and everyone's going to get All right, so C FFI functions. Um, so you can call through then. So DLSIM is a function that you can use. You can pass it the name of a function, look up the name of that function, get back a pointer. Uh, so here, I provide that one already. And with that one, you can now get access to any other ones you need. Now, the thing to note, however, is if you just call DLSIM, you're going to get back a pointer, just a void pointer. So if I ask for the type of my get UID, it's void. And if I try to call it, it's not going to work. But I can then typecast that to a function. And then I can call that. Uh, and it would work just like I would expect. So now I can kind of bridge through all my C stuff. But I also bridge through Objective-C. Uh, and I allow you to use default, like normal Objective-C syntax in the JavaScript land. And you get back Objective-C objects. So here are all these Objective-C syntax things. And you'll see what I get back still is an Objective-C object with a little at sign. Uh, does this make sense? Who here has not done much Objective-C? All right, most people have not done much Objective-C. So I mean, before, it wasn't important with substrate, because it's like, well, I just you're one of these languages you'll catch. But now we're actually in script. So the at symbol is a special syntax escape that allows you to define Objective-C data structures. So if you have like a, 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 a array literal in C, or you have an initializer list in C, if you put an at symbol in front of it, now it's not that anymore. Now it's going to be an Objective-C um, map structure, it's going to be a dictionary structure, or it's going to be an Objective-C array. Um, and so here, I'm uh, with an Objective-C string is my first example. I'm going to use at hello, and I'm going to get back an NS string object instead of a character pointer or a JavaScript string. Uh, and then I'm going to use an at array. I'm going to get back an NS array object, and I'm going to render that back as an NS array object. Yet, I've bridged the object model so that if you take your Objective-C string and ask if it's an instance of a JavaScript string, it returns true. And I've done the same thing for all these other data types. Um, and, and sometimes I end up with, what I always find a little scary is that every time I look at this, I go, how does that work again? Because I'm actually a little surprised that this worked so well. Because I, I didn't build my own JavaScript runtime. I used the d existing JavaScript runtime, and I just like, went through and bridged the crap out of everything. So but because of that, you can use JavaScript functions on your Objective-C types, and they work. You can also use, you can also use um, Objective C messages on your JavaScript types. And those also work just fine. And so I've kind of bridged back and forth between all these things. And now, here's what I, what I really want to demonstrate is using script in order to modify the behavior of a function, or of, a, of, a, of an application. So you can imagine, for example, that I would like to make it so that inside of this application, every time it opens the etc passwd file, I would like to redirect that open to a different passwd file. So you see passwd is where all the account information on Unix is stored. Maybe I want to redirect it to do something different. Now, of course, if, I have an app, if I'm actually able to modify the application in any way, I probably have the ability to change its binary somehow. But that's hard. It's difficult. I would love to be able to have a little JavaScript interface I can utilize in order to make these modifications quickly. So here I'm going to look up the address of the fopen function, typecast it to the correct type. Then I'm going to import substrate. 
and I provide a library for getting access to substrate from script. Import comsorg substrate ms. And then I can use ms.hook function, pass in the fopen function, and then pass in a JavaScript replacement. So every time in the C code, it calls fopen. The arguments to that C function are going to get converted into JavaScript objects, a JavaScript string, for example, and then get passed to my JavaScript function. Then I can just use JavaScript. Well, if the path is etc pass tbd, set it to a different value, and then I'll call the original. And the yes, that actually is star o oldf, where I'm indirecting, and what you just saw three lines ago is an empty object. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm treating that as a function pointer, and there's some weird things that happen in scripts that make that actually uh, work in some crazy way. Um, and then I just have a log, which is just a global variable that's an array. I'm just going to take all these arguments, push them into it. And to demonstrate, I will call fopen, passing etc pass to bd and r, which is going to call through a script. It's going to generate a native call, which is then going to get hijacked into JavaScript, which is then going to modify the arguments, call back through into the native code, and then I'm going to return from the native code back, converting back the integer to a JavaScript integer to return it from this function to return back to the native code, which will then return back to the JavaScript code and give you that pointer. And my log, my global JavaScript variable, now includes the information that I tried to pass. And you'll note that it, it's been modified, because it, I logged it after I modified the argument. It's got, the, it's got the var pass to be defaked, but then it also has the other arguments that are just stashed in there as JavaScript objects I can easily read. So this is, this is kind of the thing that, in a way, I feel like I've been building up to all the years of doing stuff in, uh, in the world of uh, runtime software modification, is to build this system um, to be able to make these kind of modifications. And if you go to conferences like Black Hat, RSA conference, et cetera, they actually give talks. I, like, I, I go and I attend talks where people are building systems out of script. At the very, like at the core somewhere, they're, they're compiling all of their stuff to script and then running it inside of the other process. All right. Now, this is all really cool. Can I get it in the App Store? Why can't I get it in the App Store? Uh, this is actually, somebody else put something called Cydia with a really broken icon in the App Store. This is really irritating. <laughs> Um, why can't I get in the App Store? A lot of people seem to want it in the App Store. Actually, I, was, I, was, I found there was somebody who would like, put something called Cydia in the Android market. Uh, and within weeks, it was actually they were selling it, and they sold tens of thousands of copies. It was like, so this comes back to a trade-off in freedoms, um, which I think is uh, interesting to point out. And this trade-off in freedoms involves freedom from versus freedom to. Steve Jobs is really, is really into freedom from. And in a way, you could look at the GPL BSD argument as freedom from versus freedom to, because this is just a semantic linguistic argument more than anything else. But he really liked talking about freedom from versus freedom to. Uh, and he would like freedom from software modification. I mean, one of the things he wants freedom from, specifically, would like freedom from porn. Um, that was something that he was very explicit about in one of his uh, uh, press conferences, where people were talking about will there I accidentally touched my computer, which I'm not supposed to do because I'm using this little thing over here. OK. <laughs> um, what was they saying? In one of his press conferences, he was asked, will there be alternative app stores on, on iPhones? And he was like, no, no, this is not Android. There will not be a porn store on the iPhone. Um, so we don't have things like CD. We don't have things like those software modifications. So how do we actually get these things? Uh, it's due to all these crazy hacker types. Um, so this is a picture that was taken a few years ago at uh, DEF CON, which is the um, annual hacker convention, I kind of want to call it. it it's usually billed as a conference, but I think of it, it's really more of a convention. Um, and uh, these are a bunch of people who are involved in hacking, including GeoHot, POSIX Ninja, Neato TV, et cetera. All right, so how do we do it? This is a question that I've talked to some people over the course of the last few days um, of being at this conference, and, uh, and they end up asking me, what do you do and how do you do it? And I, I, I clarify with them, well, when you say, what do I do? do you, do you know what I do? I mean, that's <laughs> and, and what I'm really asking is, how do they do that? <laughs> and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how they do that, because I, I do do some of this, I, mostly on Android. So I've implemented some of the, um, is the uh, Android 4.0 exploit, which was, um, uh, there was a kernel exploit called Mempo Dipper. I implemented Mempo Droid. And then the master key exploit last year, I had the primary implementation of that, which was uh, City Impactor. Um, so I, I love vulnerabilities. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about vulnerabilities. So here are a bunch of silly vulnerabilities. So some link traversals. A symlink traversal is where there was code that was expecting to put a file somewhere. A really classic example of this is a backup restore system. So you're going like, to take a backup of your phone, and you're going to restore that backup to the phone. The thing restoring the backup to the phone is running with elevated privileges so they can modify all of the applications and set all of their permissions back, I'm sorry, all, set all of their files um, to the contents that was in the backup. The so symlink traversal, if one of those applications Instead of having a documents folder or a library folder or a little in the home directory, instead of having a little dot folder for itself, actually has a symlink 
to etc passwd and now you back up, like so you restore a configuration file, you might succeed in convincing this elevated privilege system to restore through the sim link and restore to the incorrect file. This is bad. This is a very silly vulnerability, though, but it's one that comes up all the time. So whenever we have a system that writes files, we check for it. Do you have your? No, you did not. OK. Uh, another one is a dot dot traversal. So you might have a system like a backup restore system. And in the backup restore system, you could specify a file name. And so um, this, is, this is really common where an application will store all of its stuff as files in its application folder. And so it will return back a list of all the files and their contents. You then save that. And then at some point later, you give it back a list of files and contents. What if those files? you change the names so that it, instead of being documents, uh, information, store, uh, whatever, dot, dat, it's now dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, etc, pass WD. <laughs> this works way too often uh, and is another way that people attack systems. Uh, by the way, it's also, it's also uh, most ludicrously when you see people doing this with websites where you go to like yahoo.com slash dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, etc, pass WD. I got that password file. Uh, that one's really bad. Another silly vulnerability is CHOWN. So CHOWN, a lot of times there's like a file that this system has to have access to. Maybe it's supposed to be world readable and even world writable. Um, but the, there's something of elevated privileges sets it. And oftentimes this is because there was a developer who was working on the system and the permissions were always wrong and he just gets so frustrated and he finally adds a line of code to the boot up of the system to just fix the permissions of it every single time it happens. Almost every single Android device that is not from a major manufacturer and most of the ones from a major manufacturer, if you look at their little startup scripts, there is a CHO 777 of something. So what you do is, is you take that and you make it a symlink to another file. And it's a combination of a symlink vulnerability, but this is, I bring this one up in particular because it's a, such a particular like weird thing that you don't realize it's not, you're not writing any files, you just need to get it, you just need to have access to it. Um, uh, you can use this to, for example, modify the permissions of device nodes. So now you have access to hardware drivers you're not supposed to have access to, where you might have a bug that you can actually utilize to get into the kernel. Printf. Printf always, 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 the, little, the, the first argument to printf should not be a variable. It should always be a string constant. Uh, and the, the, like people, people look at printf and it's like, oh, well, it prints a string. And so like, well, if I just give it a string, it'll print it. That's fine, right? No, no. Um, because the, um, or if you, even, if you have, even if it's like a config file or something that will print it out, um, what if that string contains a percentage mark? If that string contains a percentage mark, it's going to go off the end of the, the extra arguments and it's going to start pulling stuff, but there are no arguments. But it's C, it doesn't know that. There are no other arguments. So it just starts pulling random stuff off the stack. Uh, and so this, this, this doesn't seem that bad because you're like, well, let's get a random integer off the stack. Well, that can be an information disclosure. Um, that can be you learning something about the program that you weren't supposed to know. Uh, usually it ends up just crashing. There's like a, most of the time it's like a percentage S and then it tries to go through and it crashes or something. But there are printf percentage flags that allow you to write data while printing. Um, there's, there's a percentage flag that allows you to get the number of characters that have so far been printed halfway through a format string and then store that to a variable and then continue printing and then you can like get checkpoints throughout it. That allows you to actually like, if there's somewhere on the stack that you know, and there typically there will be somewhere on the stack a little bit farther down, uh, a, a pointer to some data structure, because that's what we put on the stack, because you put pointers to other data structures, and you want to write data to it, well, you simply do printf percentage i, percentage i, percentage i, that's just skipping. You're just going to skip a few variables, like a few arguments, percentage i, percentage i, until you get to the one that you want, and then you do percentage star, and you like store the data into that, that variable. Now you're actually modifying that data structure. Um, this is a key aspect of how the iOS 5 jailbreak worked. Um, there was a... Uh, parser for a configuration file, and the parser for the configuration file, when it did not parse, like when the config file was corrupt, it would take the token that it had found that was wrong and it would print it to the screen. This was done correctly. It would call a log function, it passed percentage s, and then it passed the, uh, the token name. Then the log function itself, what it did is it took the um, percentage s and, the, um, and, the, and all the arguments, it passed them through to vsprintf, which is the ability to pass the arguments like that have already come from a variadic list through get a string, a, a, a concrete string, and it passed that to the actual underlying log function, and it really shouldn't have done that. Um, so, problem. Set UID. I bring this one up because this is, I, I found this one so hilarious. This is a bug um, that uh, on Android we've now called Rage Against the Cage. So, set UID is a, 
is a function that, when you call it, allows an application to become another user account. So if you are a program like SU, which you're going to run it, you're going to give it the name of the user, SU is, first of all, on disk marked set UID root. So when it runs, it immediately becomes root. Now, um, it's going to check to see whether the password you give it is correct for the user account you asked for. And if it is, it's going to call set UID, and it's going to drop privileges back to the user that it was supposed to be. Um, or you might have um, a port you need to get access to. So if you are on Unix and you were trying to use a port under 1024, all of those are system privileged ports. Privileged ports require root access to use. This is to protect somebody from running an FTP server uh, on, their, on the massive shared university system that looks like it's the like, FTP server for the entire university. Um, so the FTP daemon has to run as root, just, just for like three lines of code long enough in order to get the port number 21 or 22, 21, I guess, and then drop privileges back down to the FTP user, which hopefully it's running as some kind of a um, user that doesn't have much privileges. Set UID can fail, even if you're root. So set UID, much like many other system calls, returns a, a, a number, which represents its error value. Um, and it, it will return either 0 or negative 1. And then you can check error no if it's negative 1. And you can see whether or not it succeeded or not. Um, and nobody ever checks this. And this, how do you make it fail? I mean, that's the question. How, how could it even fail? I mean, I'm root. This is, I mean, I, I just checked the account exists. It's, it, it, Unix doesn't even care if the account exists anyway. It's just a number. Um, it's just going to set my, I mean, if the account doesn't exist, I'm just going to get set to an arbitrary number or something. How does it fail? You might have a quota. So if you're only allowed to run five processes and somebody runs a process as root and tries to become a process as your user, that might fail because you are not allowed to run more than five processes and you already have five. So what you do is you go into, you go on your Android device and you fork bomb it as you. And now, as the shell user, you've managed to use up all processes on the system, and you are still trying to get more. Your forks are still failing. You are still trying to fork bomb. What you then do is you cause the ADB daemon to restart, the Android debugging bridge daemon. Uh, and there are various ways you can ask it to restart. I believe you can just ask it to restart. Um, and so it will then shut down. The monitoring system will start up a new copy of it. The new copy starts as root, binds the correct ports, then drops to shell privilege. But it can't, because you've Fork bomb the shell account, and in those in intermediate, like very short period of time, you've taken over the last process slot that it had, and now the ADB daemon is running as root, and now you can just connect you to the ADB shell, and you get a root prompt back, and you have and you have full access to the system. So these are all really dumb bugs in a way, but a lot of dumb bugs give you access to the system. Here's another interesting dumb bug from recently: shell shock, which was brought up earlier in uh, Case's talk. I think I pronounced it again correctly. Hopefully, okay. Um, so. I don't think you went over it, though, right? It was in a question, OK. Um, so the uh, shell shop bug involves taking bash functions and then exporting them to subprocesses. So you can declare a function in the shell. You can then export that function in the shell. What it does is it constructs an environment variable with the name of the function, which is equal to the code for the function. And the code for the function has been normalized. So instead of having the semicolon and the spacing, it's changed the spacing, and it's used new lines, et cetera. The subshell then does, it goes through all the environment variables every time it starts up, and it finds all of the ones that start with open parenthesis, close parenthesis, space, open brace. And for all of those ones that it finds, it takes the name of the variable, it puts the value of the variable after it, and it just runs it like a bash code, which will cause a function to get generated. But if you add a semicolon, and then put more code afterwards, such as in this case, I'm going to call, I'm going to try to run date, it will actually run that code. And this is kind of a, it, it, it's, it, in a way, it's a dumb mistake. But in another way, it's actually not a dumb mistake. Because the, in the historical context of the way this thing worked, it actually makes a little more sense. So I made one more example here quickly. You actually, everyone always talks about putting it in the uh, value. Um, one of the things I point out in the mailing list, you can also put it in the name. Um, this is because somebody else said that you couldn't put it in the name. And, and then they were like, well, this is actually a different bug. And I'm like, well, I think it's the same bug. And, and then we're just going um, I, I ended up getting involved in the mailing list because it's actually broke a bunch of my code, the way that their patch worked. Um, and, uh, and so I, I actually happened to know the guy who wrote Bash. And so I got, ended up getting him involved in the, in the argument. <laughs> um, I was like, Jay's code might have been written 20 years ago, for all you know. Um, this is the guy who wrote Bash, by the way. His name is Brian Fox. Now, so I was saying the context is different. Here are some pictures from forever ago. Um, I mean, they didn't really have good cameras back then, right? You know? <laughs> 
uh, of, of when he was working at MIT. Uh, so he was the first uh, employee of the Free Software Foundation under Richard Stallman, um, so the guy I mentioned earlier. Uh, Richard Stallman um, was, uh, was technically a volunteer. So Brian Fox was the first employee of the Free Software Foundation. Um, so the shell, in order to get environment variables to the shell, you have to be the parent process of the shell. Well, if you're the parent process of the shell, you can only run the shell as your user. Now, if you can only run it as your user, and the shell runs as your user, if the shell runs it, you can just run stuff as the shell. I mean, if the shell's going to, you, you can configure the shell. There, there are config files to the shell. I mean, it doesn't seem that crazy to run stuff, even accidentally, uh, much less on purpose, as the shell. The shell is already running all sorts of things. Because if you go back to the late 80s when this was built, this is when Gopher was deployed, but the interweb, the World Wide Web, was not. Uh, and so this is something that Brian has been doing a bunch of interviews over the course of the last week with people from the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera. And it's like bashing their head in, trying to get them to understand that this is before the internet even really existed. Um, he did, however, in, in an interview Thursday, Mr. Fox, the bash inventor, joked that his reaction to the shell shock discovery was, aha, my plan worked. <laughs> He's very happy about this quote. Really would like to hear more, have more people hear it, so that's why I'm bringing it up today. All right. So there are, however, some more complicated types of bugs. So this is a buffer overflow. And so buffer overflows, um, so this function is going to get a username from the user typing it in, and then is going to return a new copy of that string. Like this code is, there, there's some obvious bugs that this code could have. I removed all of the obvious bugs that this code could have. So like this, this isn't returning data that's sitting on the stack. This data, is, this data is correctly being duplicated to the heap and being returned. And you can imagine somebody writing this because, well, how do you, like there's, there isn't really a good function um, in like the beginning C, here's how, here are like the first three things you learn for getting content from the screen that allows you to like heap allocate data that it comes back to you. There's a better function which is like get line and stuff like that. But you end up like, this this is the function that was really commonly just there. And it's a really dumb function because it doesn't care how much data comes in. So gets takes a whole line of content from the user, stores it into a buffer. So if the user types more than 64 characters, it's going to store more than 64 characters into this buffer. So we then ask, what is the data that comes after this array? And if you look at the stack frame, for, the, for this function. So there's the, what, what happens when you call a function is, is that all of the arguments, um, like on x86, all of the arguments get put on the stack. Then the pointer to the location in the previous function you were at gets put on the stack. Then when this function begins, all of its data gets put on the stack. So we're going to have 64 bytes of data on the stack. If you overwrite through your um, uh, past 64 bytes, you're going to overwrite that return pointer. And then you're going to overwrite arguments. And then you're going to return, overwrite the data from the previous function, overwrite its return pointer, overwrite its arguments. You're just going to be able to keep writing as far as you want to go. So the simple way of exploiting this bug is you provide shell code, which is code that is going to spawn a shell or give you access to the system somehow, um, as your username. Like you type in a bunch of binary assembly. Clearly, you're not really going to type this in. You're going to like have a computer program somehow pipe this into the system. Uh, and then you're going to for the first 64 characters of assembly code. And then you're going to have the next four characters where the return pointer on the stack is. You're going to provide the pointer of this buffer. And computers are so deterministic that you can run this yourself, figure out the address of the buffer usually is, and then just put that pointer there, and it's usually going to work. Really simple, totally doesn't work on modern systems due to a lot of the things that Case probably talked about, like mitigation strategies that people have. At least hopefully, I don't know. But um, the, uh, but one of the big ones that um, we have on the iPhone is signature checking. So you cannot run code that, the, that did not get signed by Apple. So I can't just put code in this buffer and run it. Another one is, is non-executable stack, which is that if you have data on the stack, it shouldn't be code. I can't run it. So I can't just put code on the stack. <laughs> like there, there are reasons, a bunch of reasons why I shouldn't be able to run this code. So what you can do instead is something called a return to libc attack. So a return to libc attack is where instead of providing the pointer to my data block, I'm going to provide the pointer to code that already exists. Maybe all I really want to do is unlink a file. Uh, so unlink is the delete function in C. Um, if I would just like to unlink a file, it turns out really awesome. On ARM, the system that I use all the time, iPhones, Android devices usually run ARM, uh, the first argument and the return value are the same register. They're stored in the same place in the CPU. So if I return the username from this function, it puts it into register 0. And if I call a function, it comes in register 0. So if I could just have this function return to the unlink function, it will just unlink my username as if it were a file. 
So I now have 64 characters of file name I can type in, maybe etc passwd. And then I put a no character, and then I put a bunch of spaces in order to pad my way up to 64 bytes. Then I put the address of unlink, and now the non-executable stack and code sign protections are worthless. I have now unlinked etc passwd. Turn to libc sucks. But return to libc is kind of limited in the sense that you can only really call one look thing. It has to be a function that kind of exists somewhere, et cetera. And that word brings us to this concept of return-oriented programming. So return-oriented programming is where I'm going to use my stack frame as program. I'm going to, in essence, script the C runtime. When I say the C, what is the C runtime? The C runtime is this concept that I've got stack frames that have return pointers. And when then I call a function, it will get put on the return, um, return stack. And then when I return, it will go back to that previous function. There is a, a, a semantic runtime, a semantic model that all these functions utilize. And what I can do is I can take advantage of that by providing a program in the form of half-completed stack frames and return pointers that I will re keep returning to. I will then look at, I will look for functions. I will find functions in the normal C library whose end of the function has something useful in it, something valuable. Maybe it copies register one to register two. And maybe another one adds three to register two and stores it in register two. And then another one, so I've got all these little building blocks. And if you have enough building blocks, you're eventually going to find a Turing complete set of building blocks. They're going to be the weirdest building blocks you've ever had. It's like a, a, a machine built by a devil. Um, a, a programming language Malbolge, for example, or um, uh, Intercal, um, where you're just like, I don't even understand why somebody would even thought of this. But you now, if you especially if you can build a computer program to, to take advantage of all this as opposed to having to do it by hand. You can now build programs where you simply stitch together tiny little register snippets of tiny fractions of functions as you kind of return back through all of this code. And that allows you to get control of, a, um, control of a program and sometimes execute very arbitrary things. So this is something I find really fascinating. And this is something that, of course, itself could take up. You could spend an hour talking about like, examples of how it works and showing demonstrations. And you could spend an entire class, um, like a course even, talking about techniques and ways of finding all these what we call ROP gadgets. Um, but I, I hope this is a little, just a little bit of an overview in case you find this fascinating. You can now like, go and see like, how some of this works by searching for a constant return-oriented programming. All right. Any questions? OK. So all of this is essentially. Uh, all of this is essentially tampering with systems. Uh, and there is something that, we, that I now will talk about, which is the, the politics of this and some of the legality of this, which is the, there is a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, which was put together. And everyone always blames Congress, but it's, you actually should blame the executive branch, because all Congress did is they implemented a treaty that the executive branch um, signed a while before. And so we were actually required to implement some kind of law related to it. I mean, I guess they could have just said no, in which case then the executive branch has gotten a serious problem, and then we end up going to war, maybe. I don't know. But, um, so there's a clause that states that you are not allowed to tamper with any effective control mechanism on a copyrighted work. So the iPhone has a bunch of copyrighted code on it, and it has a bunch of mechanisms to protect all that copyrighted code, one of which is all of the systems that make it secure. Arguably, it should be security for the user, but I will argue it's effectively security for Apple. Um, and then protect all of, the, uh, all of that code from being modified. And so by us modifying it, by us providing tools to modify it, we are tampering with all these effective control mechanisms, you might think, you might say. And I say that because it's, it's all we don't really know. Um, if you were, it has not been tested in court, if you were to actually take this to court, I think it would be a really interesting fight. Um, this is something that the Electronic Frontier Foundation is, of course, really um, imp um, active in, uh, not proselytizing is the wrong word, um, uh, doing outreach related to. And so they will, um, they actually put together a, um, a, a, they put together an exemption request from the DMCA for jailbreaking. So well, what is that? So the Digital and Copyright Act, as, as I just said, is this anti-tampering clause. The anti-tampering clause goes too far. And we actually, like, it doesn't just go too far in my opinion. It goes too far in the opinion of the people who made the law. Because there are things that you're supposed to be able to do. You're supposed to, as an educator, be able to take 30-second snippets of video and utilize them in your classroom. You're supposed to be able to um, utilize uh, books um, and be able to read them um, and like, have, other, have like, people read them for you. That's like recording for the blind and dyslexic projects aren't considered illegal, um, despite the fact that they are providing recordings of the content that are inside of a book. Um, you were supposed to be able to do all sorts of different things, and now you can't because e the Kindle has an encrypted book format, and you can't get the book off. DVDs have encrypted all the movies. So you can't copy 30-second snippets of the movie anymore. How are you going to get access to this content? So there has to be some way of allowing you to actually remove all of these uh, mechanisms, and that's these, these exemptions from the anti-tampering clause. The exemptions from the anti-tampering clause, however, are just so horribly broken, I will argue, because they only technically exempt the person who um, is doing the actual copying. They don't exempt the people trying to provide tools to help you do the copying.
copying. I don't know if, I mean, like if you take your average, you know, um, uh, uh, elementary school teacher who's trying to get 30 seconds of video, I don't think they're going to be able to break the encryption on a DVD unless somebody like me helps them. <laughs> the exemption doesn't help me, it only helps them. Um, but the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, wanted to put forward an exemption, and they actually, weirdly enough, have to get the exemption renewed every three years. This is another really broken aspect of this. Um, so the last one was three years ago, in 2012, the DMCA hearings. This is, I was actually at the uh, hearings in LA. I was in the audience, by the way, um, but I actually, the question got lobbed to me, which I thought was really cool. Uh, <laughs> there was, uh, the question was asked of the person from the EFF, and then she didn't really know the answer. She said, we actually have the person who runs Sedia in the audience, Jay. <laughs> um, all right, so what we were trying to do three years ago is to expand. So the exemption that we got in 2009 was for wireless telephone handsets. This exemption is, only covers wireless telephone handsets, very narrowly defined. They really like really narrow defined, narrowly defined things. iPhone, wireless telephone handset, makes sense to me. iPod, it's not really a wireless telephone handset. iPad, not really a wireless telephone handset. Apple TV. Uh, any, what about other stuff, though? I mean, there's like an uh, Apple, I'm um, sorry, like the PlayStation 3. So the PlayStation 3 um, was something that uh, many of you may have seen a lot of the news related to. Um, there was uh, George Hotz uh, did the PlayStation 3 jailbreak and then got sued by Sony related to it. And I think they were claiming some things related to the DMCA, although we never really got that far. Um, the, so in 2012, our goal was to expand the exemption to cover tablets and to cover, uh, and to cover video game consoles. All right, so this PlayStation 3 hack, to talk a little more about this for a second. To talk a little more about this for a second. There we go. Um, so, uh, GeoHot uh, um, was, uh, so PlayStations are actually sold at a loss, and then all the software is sold, uh, and then PlayStation makes money off of it, and so they essentially had to turn this into a massive lawsuit situation in order to try to stop GeoHot from distributing all this stuff. Um, um, GeoHot then um, ended up uh, kind of rallying the troops in a way, which is in a w was also kind of really bad. Anonymous did a bunch of attacks on Sony, uh, taking Sony um, online, offline for over a week. Um, but so uh, this, this kind of culminated in an epic rap battle. If you do a search for GeoHot rap on YouTube, you can see this. If you haven't seen it, it is awesome. I highly recommend you watch this rap. Uh, we were watching it in the uh, hallway a little bit earlier today. Um, where uh, during, during, the, uh, the, during the lawsuit, which is actually was a lawsuit about jurisdiction, because uh, lawsuits are always really boring. Uh, what always ends up happening is, is that, well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to do a bunch of discovery on the other person, and they're going to do a bunch of discovery on you, and you're going to have a bunch of arguments. But before you even do that, you have to decide what court you're going to do the discovery in, and where all this is going to happen. And this is just a jurisdiction battle. And so Sony wanted it to be, I'm oh, sorry, um, GeoHot wanted it to be um, a mega national Japanese corporation sues local kid um, because he, like, you know, harmed the business model in some silly way. Sony wanted it to be Sony Online of America and California Corporation uh, is getting, uh, you know, where we've got a ton of computer companies are go is getting hacked by this punk kid from Jersey. Uh, and this, this, this argument is what ended up being the argument in the courts for a while. And so we didn't even get to see an argument about the DMCA. Uh, and the jurisdiction battle, we didn't even settle that. Um, like, well, we didn't even like, under like come to a uh, uh, completed idea on that because it got settled out of court. So uh, there was, um, uh, GeoHot had to do something, and he can't tell anyone that part of the rules of the settlement is he couldn't tell us what he did. Uh, and in exchange, um, he you know, gets, gets off that particular lawsuit, and specifically no precedent is, is made, which means that if you do something, Sony's still allowed to sue you, and the court can't look at the fact that this was settled and say that that means that this shouldn't go through or anything like that. So we've essentially learned nothing. <sighs> All right, so I mentioned now that why Sony cares. Sony cares because of, because of piracy. Um, of, their, of their products. And so when you have a pirated game console, very quickly you see people pirating video games. And if you pirate the video games, EA doesn't make as much money selling video games. EA then is giving a lot of the money they make anyway to Sony. And so then they complain to Sony, and then Sony is like, oh, well, we were, I guess we were supposed to, all this stuff happens. Apple doesn't have the same business model, which is why I think we don't really see as much flack from Apple. Um, Apple sells hardware, they make tons of money on hardware, they make almost no money on software. If you do the math out, it's like less than 1% of their actual income could possibly come from the App Store. The Android market actually loses money. Right, so um, when you actually then, uh, and another thing is that we have this massive ecosystem surrounding Cydia, which is a paid software distribution system for making all these features. And so we can actually make arguments demonstrating that there's a lot of stuff you can do um, as a, in the legitimate ecosystem. And so I was really happy the Copyright Office actually said, while well, joint creators raised concern about pirated applications that are able to run on jailbroken devices, the record did not demonstrate any significant relationship between jailbreaking and piracy. Yes! They still did not give us our exemption on tablets. 
So here's actually I, out of order. So here's the here's like the actual text, right? Computer programs that enable wireless telephone handsets to execute software applications, where circumvention is accomplished. Yeah, yeah. Telephone handset, all the stuff about telephone handsets, and so Apple TVs, iPod touches. I do this all out of order. Now, iPod touches. Why is it not updating to my? There we go. iPod touches, iPads. Is this a tablet? This is a tablet, okay. The reason why I brought this up is, is that at the hearing, um, the guy who was, uh, one of the people who was actually on the panel, held up a uh, Kindle and was like, is this a tablet? I don't, I don't think this should count. Now, maybe some of us laugh, but I mean, now, so this, I just explained a bunch of stuff related to business models. Kindles are sold at a loss, and they make money selling books. Trying to go and say that the way that the system is, or like the entire like, market is set up is broken, and leads to this problem is a really complicated argument, and one that we need to have better ways of trying to actually have the argument. Um, and it's something that leads to us being unable to get exemptions for tablets because we don't have a good way of either claiming that an iPad is a tablet and a Kindle is not, or claiming that Kindle shouldn't exist. <laughs> so this leads to um, uh, Newt Gingrich uh, had, uh, had posted a video that a lot of people on the internet laughed at, and I was actually really sad that everyone was laughing at it because this was actually the core issue that we had in our DMCA battles. Um, he posted this video called, We're Really Puzzled, holding up a phone saying, we don't know what to call this. And pointing out that this, this thing, it, it's become so integral to a lot of our life, and we call it a phone, it's really confusing, we don't know what to call it. And people are like, well, clearly you know what to call it. I mean, and they have various names to call it, et cetera. But when you think, okay, that is a phone. Phones are just a communication system. If there is a phone inside of your car when you are stopped, and somebody, and like a, by a police officer, and that police officer has reason to believe that there might be something in the car that might be illegal, and there's just a phone in there, are they allowed to look at what the phone has been doing? If it's just a phone, you can make that argument a lot better, and now I might not still make that argument, but I'm just saying, if it's just a phone, you can make that argument a lot more easily than if it's a brain enhancement device that essentially contains all of the things you've been doing for the last three years of your life, all of the history of communication you've had, combined with all of the things you've been learning about, all of the things that you own, because now you have all these digital books, all these digital media. Um, you have, I mean, if it's really like that massive of amount of content, that changes it from being just a communication medium to being something really awesome. And if we were to start utilizing different terminology for these things, that might change the way that people have to kind of regulate it. It also would mean that things wouldn't necessarily fall under existing regulations in the same ways. And so this is what Newt Gingrich is talking about when he's like saying, this is a horrible name for this thing. It's not really a phone anymore. It does so much more. Uh, and um, and so we remember the same issues when we're talking about like well tablets and all these things. Well, we've really gotten I mean, like it's, it, it, Kindle is an e-reader, is iPads an e-reader? iPads also an, a music playing device. It's also a it's it's also um, now I mean, it's essentially now you're getting like tablets that are essentially also phones, right? I mean it's just like getting how, what point does it just become a laptop with a cellular connection on it? It's a complex issue. I actually have a slide. It's a complex issue. Okay. Um, all right. So this complex issue. I'm almost done, by the way, for the people who are, I don't know, I don't know if anyone's actually like, oh, like he's running over, but he's like, I just, I just my time is just running over, but it's done. All right, so um, jailbreak me uh, is, a, is one of the jailbreaks I'm going to uh, point out in specific here, um, as where, like, where this issue becomes really complex. Jailbreak me was a website you could go to, uh, and you would be able to jailbreak your device. So what the jailbreak did um, is you were in a, what is a web browser, and they used CSS and JavaScript to rebuild the interface for the App Store. You click on Install, just like in the App Store, and Cydia starts installing on another page of Springboard. He spent forever on this. He spent months building this, so long that Apple actually fixed the bug he was utilizing. And we were all like, seriously, he wasted all that time? He's like, three hours later, he's like, I got another bug. And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> But so, <laughs> you then, and so now it's installed, and it doesn't reboot, it doesn't do anything, it's just, it's installed, it's done. Wow. Um, this was an amazing, amazing exploit, and the way that it worked is it utilized a bug in PDF rendering, um, specifically in the font hinting engine, um, that was, uh, takes blurry text and tries to make the blurry text more readable by taking a little hammer and chisel that's actually a program inside of the font that manipulates the, the rendering of the font to fit the pixel grid. He released it as open source. Because, of course, open source is awesome. And everyone should release everything they do open source, because that's the morality that Comics has. And nothing wrong with that. And he then, and, but then immediately, people are able to build exploits utilizing his exploit. And so here's an exploit for a Windows machine running Foxit Reader that opens up the calculator app, which is the stereotypical hello world for exploiting a Windows machine. The vulnerability that we have on the 
on the jailbroken device, uh, where we want to just take a few tens of millions of people who own an iPhone, we want to be able to free their device, had collateral damage effects on everybody else. It affected all, like everything in the case um, at working, working at Ubuntu, they use the same PDF um, rendering library, the, the same font rendering library specifically, uh, FreeType, to render everything in the entire operating system. <laughs> and there's a bug that we hoarded and then released at release. So when I go and I say the jailbreaking is all of this cool stuff where you get to theme and change the contents of your phone and change what it looks like and change how it behaves, in a way, I kind of need to explain that jailbreaking is the process of weaponizing exploits of zero-day vulnerabilities. Users might do this. It's a really complicated and horrible ethical challenge. And so you might then ask, well, why do I still do that? And so I, part of the reason why I say this is during Case's talk earlier today, he was talking about um, the difference between white hat and black hat hackers and the advantage and like why people should consider being a white hat hacker. I will add another category of this gray hat hacker, of this person who's doing things that are in a way bad, but are trying to do something for a good purpose where the ethical conundrum has become really confusing. Essentially, when you ask the question, is Robin Hood doing good or doing bad, there is no clear answer. So one of the things that I think a lot about when I think about uh, jailbreaking is I think about children. Yeah, that's actually the, I'm supposed to, um, th that's like the official way you're supposed to uh, reference this image. Um, it was, it's a government image that's up in the, but you're supposed to, they, they ask that you reference it using that exact title. Um, <laughs> all right, this is the thing about children. When I learned to program, I learned to program uh, here in Illinois, actually, at Highlands Elementary. Uh, I learned to program on an Apple II using, uh, um, uh, using uh, first Logo, and then a little bit later using Apple Basic in classes. Um, we had this, uh, we had this turtle device that attached to the computer that you could use in order to like, it was, it was like Logo had a, um, a, this is in the second grade by the way, um, Logo had like a pen that would like, like um, sorry, the, the turtle would carry a marker and you could go and you could do spirograph like things and it was, it was really fun and I got really excited about it. But honestly, this didn't make me a programmer. I was in the second grade, I got excited by computers, et cetera. I ended up playing games on the computers, et cetera. It wasn't until I had this TI calculator that ran TI Basic that had a, ca a cable that I could use to connect all of my friends' TI calculators that I really got into programming. And people still use this stupid calculator. <laughs> That's really depressing, isn't it? I mean, it's like, this is a TI-81. They've got like, you know, the, the, I mean, a little bit, a few years later, I had the TI-92, but almost no one else had. Um, the the TI-82 is still sold. The TI-87 is effectively the same thing. But um, this, this device running TI Basic was something that all children had, all children were required to have, and was programmable, and you could distribute software with it. This made a lot of people people, my generation, programmers. I think that the universal system that people currently have is the iPod Touch. So iPod Touch is a very cheap device that is given away for free with a lot of computers. Parents end up getting an iPod Touch. It is a fairly harmless device because it's not a phone, so your child isn't going to be calling weird people and doing things like that. Um, you're then going to, the iPod Touch is a game machine, so, and it's a fairly cheap game machine, and the games are cheap as well, and so instead of having like a PlayStation Portable or some other kind of um, portable game device, you might give them an iPod Touch. iPod Touches, children have these things. The iPod Touch, to me, needs to be a universal, universally programmable system that children are able to program on and distribute their software to each other. I don't think it's okay enough to be able to have an iPod Touch, a special developer version of it that you buy that's unlocked. I don't think it's sufficient enough to pay a hundred dollar subscription fee a year in order to, be able to make these things programmable. I think that people who have this device who, because this device is just so universally spread among people who don't have, the, don't have that kind of money to do those things, um, and children who might not be able to convince their parents to even understand what it means to program a device, because that's the situation that a lot of people were in with, um, uh, with like their GI calculators. Their parents don't understand programming. Their parents are accountants or something. Um, I think that's really important. And so what we've ended up, though, is we've ended up in a situation um, where uh, people like Tim Cook and Steve Jobs are now controlling the experience that people have of being able to utilize software. Maybe at some point, almost all computing. Uh, of course, there are, there are competitors to iPhones, but the competitors are still locked down. Um, Samsung Android devices are locked down. Uh, HTC Android devices are locked down. Motorola Android devices are almost all locked down. Google's aren't, but Google is a minority player in the actual hardware part of the market. They mostly provide hardware in order to be an incentive for the other players to make better hardware. Um, so if you actually have an Android device, you probably have a lockdown device and you're relying on exploits, which thankfully there are more of them, um, but it doesn't, the fact that they're easier to exploit doesn't make them more open because the hardware is closed. The software might be open source, but the hardware is closed. You cannot modify it as the end user, which is why I have to make all those points about GPL. You are still having closed software. So 2015, it's three years after 2012, we have another DMCA exemption cycle coming up. We're gonna try for tablets again, but we need to figure out some way of defining them. Um, I always argue that we should really be working on uh, computers. Uh, I really think we should get DMCA exemptions for just computers in general. Um, but 
there's a process by which you can leave comments. So, and these comments are actually really important. Um, they actually read all these comments. So you write a comment explaining, it can be as short as a paragraph, it can be long as like an essay, I, I, or as long as like a 50-page um, like report. Um, but it can be as short as a paragraph. And you send this, you make a PDF or a Word document, and you send it to the Copyright Office. There's a way you can do this. And they actually post all of these on the government website. You can go, last year we got, sorry, three years ago, we got hundreds of these. And it really made the difference, is my understanding, from all the people who are kind of in the back room of all of this thing. Uh, and if we can do this for all the things we're trying to expand it to, we might be able to actually change some of these laws or be able to get better exemptions as we like demonstrate um, the, the need for these systems. Now, I always say this, and people are like, well, when do I do this? I don't remember when to do this. And some people complain that, well, I'm, no one's going to remember to do this. And I actually got called out two talks ago for not providing any kind of actual legitimate call to action. So if you go to groups.sorkit.com, you'll get redirected to some uh, Google Groups page. And you can you click on Browse, and you can click on Call to Action, and then you can add yourself to that group. Uh, and then I will send you an email. I'm not going to send you an email for any other reasons other than like these DMCA things, if there's something you can do like right now. Like you can send like a comment, like the comment window opened or something. Um, so. Please leave comments. If you think you would like to, but you might forget, please add yourself to this group. Thank you. <laughs> Technically, I am eight minutes over, so I don't really have any time for questions. But I'm happy to sit here and answer questions, because I mean, there's nothing, anything else you can do. But I'm happy to sit here once we, you know, everyone's leaving, and I can continue standing here answering questions. So. If no one has any questions, you're all tired. I was confusing anyway. You didn't understand anything. Yes? Hi, um, What's happening with uh, serial substrate for Android? Because now you have Exposed, so uh, are you doing anything with it? So Exposed, uh, Exposed is very similar. Exposed um, does not support native hooking. And Exposed, I don't think, I actually purposely stopped keeping up with it because I ended up getting kind of frustrated with a lot of the Android community aspects. Um, I, the exposed line last check doesn't support any of the current versions of Android. And considering there's some companies that have actually started contacting me related to getting Cydia on Android, um, now actually supported again, now that exposed seems to not be being updated. Um, I, I, it sounds like they're not updating it. So uh, you might see me uh, like bothering to update it again soon. The, um, as, it works fine on Android up to Android 4.4, which is the current version of Android. So it works. Like it doesn't really, it only needs to be updated for the new version of Android that isn't quite out yet. Question. Uh, my question is how is doing what you do affect your perception of how the power structure is generally? The question was how doing what I do um, affects my ex experience, or was it uh, uh, perception of power structures generally? I, 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 for a long time, thought that. A lot of things are very complex. Uh, I think that a lot of things are, I mean, everyone's constantly swimming in gray. Uh, and I, I think that it's a really, I, I, I think it's really interesting to sit down and have the ethical arguments and conversations related to things like jailbreaking. Um, I don't know if my perception of power structure has necessarily changed specifically because of it. My perception of power structure is constantly changing, though, just because, I mean, as I get older and as I get like, more experienced in dealing with power structures, um, I, I keep learning more about things. But. Yeah, I don't know if that was at all helpful. Yes? Oh, one thing was that was interesting about Cydia was we did not have just apps, we had tweaks. So I have my YouTube application and I can add tweaks on that. One of my questions was why this concept never comes to Linux or Macintosh? Because it, it really makes sense to have this kind of tweaks on a system that's more open. So the question was about the concept of tweaks, um, these extensions, modifications, the kind of features that I would talk about in the feature store. Why this concept um, has seemed to really caught on on iOS and why it has not caught on on, for example, Mac OS or Linux or systems that are even designed to be open in various ways. Um, uh, the first thing I'll point out about that is, is that I think that in order to really make this work, you need to have somebody who is really passionate about it trying to make it happen. I've been interested in software modification since well, since I was in college. Um, I mean, I, I, I try to remember like when I actually first got interested in it, and I was like, well, technically that was when I had that game genie. So I've been interested in this stuff since I was a little kid, but I, it's just like it's been my primary focus of like how do you modify and maintain, and maintain software that other people have built. I published a paper um, with some people at UCS, well, with, with uh, my advisor in 2004 um, on um, uh, software modification in Java. 
Uh, and so, I mean, three years before the iPhone came out, I was interested in doing the software modification. I, I, I don't, there, are, there are some people who do software modification, and so I can then counter your question and say, well, the, another person who's really passionate about software modification is Slavicus, um, who was the guy who started um, RipDev and did Application Enhancer, which was a tool that was incredibly popular on Mac OS 10.2 through 10.4. Uh, and there was a theme engine um, called Shapeshifter, I believe, that um, utilized um, all of his uh, runtime software modification functionality. And this, uh, as I said, it was, it was actually it was incredibly popular. It was incredibly popular to the point where Logitech needed to add a feature to um, make their scroll wheels work when you plug them into Macs, because Macs didn't have scroll wheels at the time. They used Application Enhancer, licensed it from Slavicus to do that. Uh, and uh, that broke the Mac OS 10.4 update process, um, which caused Apple to get really, really, really angry at Logitech. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, the concept of, of these kinds of hacks. And they were, they were called hacksies, uh, as opposed to like tweaks or something like that kind of term. Um, as, so, so, I, so part of it is that it actually has been. And also, continuing on Mac OS X, um, there was then something called Symbol, S-I-M-B-L, and now Easy Symbol. Um, which allow you to make software modifications. Um, I don't think that, but there isn't somebody who's really trying to turn it in, like make the distribution process as easy, although there have been a couple of attempts. Um, but the, the thing that I will then point out is that, is that on Linux, I think you actually get screwed by the openness. Um, so but when you have a system where everything is open source, um, so, and this is actually something I think held back the Android community for a long time as far as like being able to make these kinds of modifications, the way you think about modifying systems is I'll get the source code, modify the source code, recompile the system, and give you a new one. And it, it's so correct, right? That's how you should modify the system. But your system modifications you want, and the modifications that you want, and the modifications that you want are all different. And so when you have all these different kinds of modifications that you want to mix together, how do you get them all to mix? And some of them are going to be dumb. This modification that I want on my phone might only work half the time, but it's so useful. And it's like, well, it's a patch some developer made that, you know, when you actually, like, no one's going to upstream it because it's going to crash half the time. Uh, it's a bad feature. Maybe it's a confusing feature that only somebody who spends days learning how the feature works can actually utilize. They're dumb features. They're not going to get merged. Because these are dumb features that are not going to get merged or that only a very small amount of people actually want and so it doesn't have the maintenance um, overhead for bothering to merge it, it's not going to end up in the distribution. It's not going to end up on your system. How are you going to have it? Your system is going to have to do something called a patch quilt. Patching all the source code, um, it, when you have access to them, the full source code and you start making modifications, you tend to make a lot of modifications. And the modifications tend to be really low levels of like individual statements you might, um, and patches no longer merge correctly. Also, even just like the stereotypical patch quilt tools, um, if, you, if you change um, a, a function, you like rename and put a new one and then like call like make a wrapper and somebody else does that your patches cannot merge because you both modified the original patches just don't really work in that way substrate works at runtime but in order to do it all at runtime you need to have all the runtime symbols and the runtime symbols are usually stripped um, in order to do it at runtime you need to have written everything in programming languages that make it easy to actually conceptualize runtime symbols um, C only sort of does this uh, C++ plus removes all of them to the point where, I mean, like, you're, I mean, you're all stored in V tables. You just, you can't even really contemplate the idea of hooking functions in some cases. Um, Objective-C, on the other hand, everything is so hum humorously accessible at runtime, with the, with the runtime. I mean, it's, everything is looked up by string um, at runtime. Uh, and and it, 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 it provided a situation where there was this really popular system that was really, which is also, which is the, the final part of this, is you also need to have a system where um, there's a really strong motivation to do it. And that's the final piece is the iPhone um, came out, was incredibly popular among a subset of people who were um, uh, upper class developers, essentially, at the very beginning. Um, people who really liked utilizing OS X um, were really excited about the iPhone. Everyone else was like, this is either too expensive or it's not a very good phone. Um, didn't even have a game on it, much less have half the functionality you expected to have on a phone. So now you've got a class of people who are capable of making all these software modifications. You've got people such as Slavicus, who was actually involved in the original iOS hooking stuff before I got involved, which is why I, when I bring up these um, charismatic people, I don't, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the people who, like Slavicus is a very good example. Um, bringing application enhancer to, as mobile enhancer to the phone, then providing distribution ecosystem, which was like things like installer, et cetera, that also existed before Cydia. Then providing things that people absolutely needed, such as functionality for the device for their really popular device. That just doesn't, and it was all closed source, so you had to make these modifications in this way. And most of the people wanted something random and silly. I think when you have all those things kind of put together, you get, you get this. And I think when you're missing some of them, you, it's really difficult to make this all happen. So. I think there was a question there. Yeah, and then we can get back to you. So 
So the question was, why don't I, why, if I'm really excited about open hardware, why don't I build from scratch an open hardware system? Because no one will buy it. <laughs> uh, my, my goal is not that open hardware exists. My goal is that all hardware is open, which is a very different, different thing. Um, I, it, to me, it is not sufficient that there is an open alternative. I want the thing that you actually own to be open. <laughs> I mean, it's easy. I can have open hardware. I mean, it's actually, I mean, there's, there's, I can easily have all open hardware myself because I have the money to have open hardware, but that's not useful for most people, so. You, uh, actually, no, before. So the question was um, that uh, over, the, over the years, Apple has become more and more open in the system. And so I believe I'm interpreting the rest of your question to be looking forward in the future, where do I see the um, market, essentially, maybe you want to use the term, for something like Substrate or Script uh, in order to like, be, 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 do these kinds of runtime software modifications. Um, well, so as I explained, uh, Linux is a very open system. Um, but Linux doesn't have, as, so I will, I will call it an egalitarian patch system. So I mentioned earlier the idea that um, Android essentially got screwed by being open. So the experience for a normal person on open hardware, like if you get the Nexus device that's running all open source stuff where you can recompile the whole stack, which is actually not even true anymore, right, because of some things. But let's say, you, let's say it was like you know, three years ago, you could recompile the whole stack and you could install your whole thing on your device. People were rallying around this and making cool um, alternative ROMs for this device. This is a very open device, right? Very open software platform. These alternative, um, the, these alternative ROMs, as a developer, require you, actually, so first of all, as a user, are incredibly painful to install because you have to pick and choose a massive block of features. I want that feature. Oh, you can't have that feature because that's something that only Paranoid Android liked and that's not what Cyanogen liked. But most of Cyanogen is what you wanted and you didn't like some of the stuff from Paranoid. You couldn't pick and choose. It's really painful. And you had to like install, it takes a long time to install all of this stuff. Cydia, you go into Cydia and you pick one patch and 30 seconds later, you have that one change running on your system. You can try it out, uninstall it, try something else. You can pick and choose the features you want, see if they work together. From a developer's perspective, though, I think it's still bad. From a developer's perspective, the experience making a modification is you're going to download all the source code for Android a day later. You're going to start compiling Android a day later. You've compiled Android from source, and now you're going to make a modification. You're going to make a modification, and an hour later, you can now get a compiled binary for it that you are then going to flash to your device, which is going to take a few minutes uh, to flash all of, like, you know, the um, half a gigabyte large thing from wherever you compiled it down to your phone, flash the thing, reboot it, see if the patch worked. You've got this one change. Now the question is, how do you get people to have your change? You could distribute your own ROM. No one's going to find your ROM. You could distribute, uh, even if you get them to find your ROM, they're not going to want your ROM because there's only one feature in it that's different from whatever they were getting from someone else. And those people are continually maintaining and modifying it. You now, I mean, you can chase them. Like if you want to just provide a patch to CyanogenMod, every time Cyanogen releases a new copy, you could immediately spend the day recompiling it in order to, with your patch and keep merging it in and trying to maintain it. This is painful for you. Um, and then the user has to keep getting, like, getting from an alternative uh, install installation process. Cyanogen provides automatic updates. Are you going to have automatic updates? Probably not. Um, if you did, are you going to be able to afford automatic updates of this half, mega, of this half gigabyte large system that you're going to be doing this whole thing on? I don't know. Um, and then maybe your feature, and, you, um, and then your, uh, Cyan, if you're not chasing it, Cyanogen is going to get fixes or improvements or they're going to want to use a different ROM. They're not going to have your feature. You could try to get your feature upstreamed, but frankly, your feature probably sucked. 
And I, mean, I don't mean this like because you suck or anything, just because most features suck. When you, when you sit around on patch queues for something like Cyanogen, most of the things people bring to you are low quality patches that have some bugs in them or, low, or things that are confusing or things that are bad ideas or things that conflict with what you're trying to do. Um, so you know, well, you're going to add this feature. Well, we've already got planned a year from now. We're going to have a much better version of that. Let's not add that now. It's something that you're not going to be able to get merged anyway. I consider it a really, like, it's, it's, it's like not very egalitarian. I, I, think that, I think that actually, weirdly enough, the closed source system, where all of the software happens to be malleable. It's not open. It's just malleable. Um, we do the software is, like, Objective-C is just software that you can kind of munge. I mean, like, here, here's the weirdest one. You can take, you can DL open, which is the, like, dynamic, like, library loader. You can DL open an executable and then call functions out of it. You can load classes out of it. Like, it's just like, you, you, want, you want part of the mail app in your app? Load it and bring up the interface for it. <laughs> it's so malleable the software. Closed source, I think you actually end up with a more egalitarian environment for the developers and the users who are trying to make all these modifications than you did on the open system where everything was distributed as bricks. But at the same time, it's not as flexible and there are certain kinds of changes you can't do. And so I'm not saying that it's good. I don't, I don't want everything to be closed software. But I, I think that there needs to be, like, I don't even know. I, I just, like, but that's, that's why, like, I mean, but this was, I'm trying to answer your question about, um, as Apple becomes more open, I don't think it matters. Because even on the openest systems that we have, I think that this kind of stuff is useful. And we're finally seeing it happen on, for example, with Exposed on Android, um, or with um, actually, um, the Palm Pre, they had something. They were using patch quilts. Um, so it, had some, it, it didn't always work as well. But um, it, they, they were using patch quilts in, sorry, as part of their uh, uh, pre-wear. Um, but I, 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 I don't think it matters that Apple's becoming more open. What's the risk? Of an increasing OS X surface. OS X interface? Increasing your attack surface. Increasing attack surface. OK, so the question here is about attack surface on devices. So um, a lot, I hear a lot of times people talk about like increasing the risk of your device by jailbreaking it. Um, so the attack surface on a device that has been jailbroken versus one that has not been jailbroken is a very minuscule difference, which is that technically, if you are in the process, you have the ability to manually opt out of the memory protection. You have to do it very manually. Um, you're still sandboxed. You're still, I mean, every, if you install something from the App Store, I mean, uh, I mean if, if you're in a position where you're actually able to call the function to opt out of the memory interface, you have already taken control of the process. So I, I don't really think you've actually increased the attack surface of your device by doing that. Now, you might install software that has bugs in it, but that's going to happen. I mean, like, that's the, that installing features in, like, increases your attack surface. I mean, if you upgrade the new version of Cyanogen, you've increased your attack surface because they've added more code. So I don't really feel like that's something that we can really complain about. You might complain that the person you're getting the modification from isn't as trustworthy, and that is a valid problem. Um, but that's where I think that starts coming down to the egalitarian issue, where I, I think that it's actually like, if I want that feature and I trust that guy, I should be the person who decides if I get to trust him, not Cyanogen, not Steve Jobs. Um, who of course, I, keep, you know, I, I still always talk about Steve Jobs, but he's not, not with us anymore, but you know, not Tim Cook. Um, and so it's... It's a situation where like, I, I, I really don't think that it is a risk in that way. Uh, another thing people think is that well, you know, by jailbreaking your device, you, you've, you've, you've exploited the security problem. It's, it's bad. Well, no, if the lock was broken such that I could take a crowbar to it and open it really easily, and I take the crowbar to it and open it, I haven't made the system noticeably less secure because crowbars are cheap. <laughs> and so if, people, if, if there's a bug on the system, the bug is on the system whether you exploited it or not. And so, for example, people like um, iOS 7.1.2, uh, there is a core graphics now known exploit that was fixed in iOS 8 and has been disclosed. If you're running 7.1.2 and if you have an iPhone 4, you are running 7.1.2 or earlier because they didn't release an update for you. Um, you are currently using a buggy version of core graphics, which has the ability to get exploited by a PDF file again, which means that if I send you a text message with a hyperlink in it or I send you an email message that contains um, an attachment uh, and you open these things, I could remotely get code execution on your device. And I can now remotely use a kernel exploit on your device if I happen to have one that can run from the sandbox. And I believe, and I always forget though, I believe the Pangu 7.1.1 will. Um, certainly the, um, uh, the Comex's one worked from the sandbox. He did it from the web browser. Uh, and so I now have the ability to jailbreak your device remotely. 
uh, and take control of your system. So like, I don't, I, I, like, the jailbreaking can in fact secure you from these things because you can install patches. And in fact, we are about to release a patch for that core graphics thing that'll work on every single system um, that uh, every single phone so far in all versions of iOS up until 712 um, that will fix that bug for you. And if you're on the iPhone 4, jailbreak and install the patch. Like you were, it is bad not to. So there are risks though. And the risks are related to the fact that the hardware's closed. It's, it's more like an, um, by jailbreaking my device, I now it's more difficult to update. And so at some point when I get around to updating, I'm gonna be, it's gonna be really confusing and it's gonna be really a horrible experience and that does suck. Um, but that's not a problem with the concept of runtime code modification because that's not something that would happen to you, for example, on a desktop Mac, except for occasionally with like Logitech. They, they, they did something stupid though. So. So the, this, is a, this is a complaint, which is actually a valid one, um, which is, and in fact, one I'll even agree with, um, which is that the people who make these kinds of modifications, if I were to actually trust rank them on the world, and this is actually what I kind of mentioned earlier, the guy in his basement making this hack that I just said was probably a bad quality hack, um, especially utilizing the kinds of techniques that he has to use for this kind of thing, they're all really complicated. Even if he's really bright, they're harder to use tools, which means that the, the, even, even, even if he is really bright, he's going to make more mistakes than somebody who's not very bright. Um, and so uh, that by installing these kinds of things, you're going to end up um, adding more little tiny vulnerabilities that you can kind of compound in order to take access to the system. Um, I will actually turn your question back on you and say, I don't think you can convince users to care. So like you're asking me, how do I convince users to, to, to decrease their security in this way in order to get a feature they want? I'm going to ask you, I don't think that no matter how hard I try, I can convince a user to not do that. <laughs> Yeah. If there's a feature that the user wants, I mean, this is why this is why security is such a hard problem, is that is that people are willing, like they get an email attachment for something inane, they're saying that if you install this thing, it's going to do this horrible, horrible thing, really, and they install it. Yeah, but this goes back to my question. So do you see this as something for the generally purpose users or just a really small subset of the community? Um, so as it currently stands, a lot of the people, the question was, do I see this for the general public or for a small subset of the community? Um, as it currently stands, I see this as um, something that the general public is interested in. Uh, the reason why I put it that way is that I think that the legal, political, and sometimes moral complexity of getting to that point is sufficiently high, as is the technical boundaries of being able to make these modifications. The fact that nearly 10% of people with an iPhone two years ago, when I got the numbers from like the really large company that tracks all of this stuff, have a jailbroken device, that's insane. I mean, the, you void your warranty, you've got to download sketchy tools from random websites that are sometimes written in languages you don't understand, because like in the US, you know, a lot of them have been written in English for the last few years, but like if you're in, if you're in Poland, we don't make the tool in Polish. Um, and then you're going to use this, use this tool on your device and you're going to like, and then you're going to get this confusing piece of software written by me. Yeah, it's confusing, I'm sorry. And you're going to have to do all this, and 10% of people do this. <laughs> if this were easy to do, if this were something that, if the device were actually open at the same time as being malleable, at the same time as we had an ecosystem for it, I think you'd see an incredibly large number of people doing this. And I can now go back and I can cite when the iPhone first came out, I think the numbers were closer to 50% of people with an iPhone were jailbreaking it. Now, the motivation was really high. There were no games. Um, but it was also so easy. We had almost every version that we had um, was a very easy tool. Um, and then um, the, we always had a version within days of the new version of iOS. And the, um, for a very large amount of the, the, that early history, we had that TIFF bug that worked on iOS, uh, iOS 1.1.1. So we had a jailbreak um, by the web browser. And this was something where I mean, like you were just you'd be talking to your friend, and he'd see your phone do something cool, and he's like, "How do I get that?" It's like, "Give me 10 minutes." And like 10 minutes later, his phone has that feature on it, and you don't have to know what you're doing to make his phone have that feature on it. Uh, and I, I think, so I think it's something that your average user wants. And I, and I will then also cite that the uh, theme engines on iOS X 10.2 were incredibly popular. I will also cite the Game Genie was incredibly popular.
whereby they don't, as in like, you do not, as in you don't really release them until like, after inspection and the next version. So the question was about, first one I didn't quite understand, but it was, um, um, I, think, I think this is actually an important series of questions, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm answering this series of questions. Um, if anyone else has a question like, and they feel like they're not getting get to answer their, ask their question, please raise your hand. And I know that behind you, I'm still remembering that you have a question. So there, there is, um, the, the, why, if there's such a demand, why are jailbreakers leaving the scene and why are jailbreaks mostly retroactive patches? Well, first of all, um, I, I'm going to look at the second one first. The, the jailbreaks aren't mostly retroactive patches. Um, the, um, actually, what oftentimes, what's actually kind of humorous, a lot of the bugs we end up using just don't get fixed in the next version and we get to reuse them over again. Um, so I can tell you, like, they're very clearly zero days. Um, actually, there was a guy in the audience at the talk at Black Hat this year, which was by a team from Georgia Tech who was doing uh, jailbreak research, and they were talking about the web of bugs that were used in Evasion 7 and which ones weren't fixed and how they could reuse those bugs in order to get kind of a, we call them a fail break technically, they called it a jailbreak, but they were wrong. Um, the, uh, and, and I saw there was a guy from Apple who was in the row over to my left, and when the, this one slide came up with this bug, so the guy is sitting there, and, I, and he sits the whole time, it's just kind of like, this like, this like, you know, really open, like, like, I'm just sitting here watching what's going on, and this slide comes up, and he goes, and he pulls his laptop up, puts it on his lap, opens it up, and I'm like, okay, he's fixing that bug finally. <laughs> We've had that bug forever. <laughs> So I, I don't think that's the, I really don't think that's the case. Um, and um, as far as jailbreakers leaving the scene, uh, it's there. There are a couple things. First of all, is that um, it's you do this for a while, and then you get kind of bored. I mean, this isn't new. Um, GeoHot hasn't been doing jailbreaks for many years. Comex hasn't been doing jailbreaks for a couple years. People who did the really early jailbreaks left. There's nothing new going on. You do this for a little while while you find it interesting, then you move on to other things. If you do it constantly, it becomes your job. Some people are really good at turning things into jobs. And part of the reason why I have so much stuff that I run in the jailbreak ecosystem is simply that I'm kind of a responsibility sponge. I sit next to people who build things and then they, like, like, like Comex and, uh, Geo, uh, sorry, Comex and uh, Siege Pwn built uh, Jailbreak QA, a website that we have in the ecosystem for asking and answering uh, tech support questions. And they just couldn't stand running it anymore. And they were like begged me to take it from them. <laughs> and so I maintain that website now. And that happened like, one day I logged into the iOS toolchain project in order to file a bug and like work on, I was gonna, I, I provided patches as well. The fact that I was providing patches apparently is what caused me to, I, went to go file the bug, I realized I was now the administrator and I never heard from the guy who worked on it ever again. Nightwatch got out of town as soon as he found a replacement. <laughs> so uh, it, it, that, that I think is actually the largest factor. Um, the second thing is, is that it, it, it has been getting more difficult. Um, there have been more and more mitigation mechanisms that have made jailbreaking become more and more difficult over time and it is something that fewer people can actually participate in. Um, I, I mean, like for example, I am not strong enough at finding exploits to really be the guy who builds the jailbreaks. That said, in the Android community, I'm, actually, I'm not even good enough at implementing the exploits to really be the guy who, like, I, I help a little bit. In Android land, though, sometimes I feel like I'm dropping down to the amateur bracket. And I get to play. It's fun. I get to help with implementing stuff. I get to help find bugs sometimes. And it's like, and that's been getting more complicated, though, too. And we're getting to see the point where only the really awesome people, like Daniel Rosenberg and uh, Justin Case, and people are actually able to really run that ecosystem. Um, and they can't stand the demands sometimes because I mean people like and that's actually another aspect is that I think that actually to kind of, again to kind of turn your question on it uh, on, uh, over it's um, part of the reason they're leaving is not because of a lack of demand it's because of too much demand. Um, Daniel Rosenberg goes on uh, XDA and releases a jailbreak for Samsung uh, Galaxy S4 I think it was and then a patch got released for it a week later and for the next month people were pissed that he didn't release an update and it's like. This was really hard to build. It was really hard to find these bugs. For all you know, there aren't any more bugs. Like, it's technically, we, we probably are, but like, you don't know that. It's like panning for gold. And these people are feeling so entitled that they start calling him names and being really angry and mean at him because they aren't releasing more stuff. That's a lot of demand. That's not, that's not too little demand. I don't actually think the demand is what necessarily drove the, the need in the first place. I, I think that it was uh, interest and, and, uh, and fun, so. Yeah, and so the, there's also an issue with um, when you release jailbreaks, um, people, uh, you spend a lot of time building the system. 
And uh, the question of how compensation works um, with relation to being able to build stuff like that is, is a complicated question. Um, the, I, I can tell you that they've been taking donations and they do get a bunch of money in donations. I don't know if they get enough money in donations really to make this exactly worthwhile, so. Yeah, pause, because um, I can, the reason why, the, so the question so far was the worst thing that could happen on your device before was losing your camera roll. That would actually often, the most reason, oftentimes the reason, most often reason people would lose their camera roll was because their backup restore bug was being utilized by the jailbreak, and the, it would back up your camera roll and fail to restore it correctly, and so there was bugs in the jailbreak tool. I'm just, I'm just telling you why that happened. Um, I, I Continue. Oh, maybe when you said lose, you didn't mean delete. You meant like I would get stolen. Oh, uh, mm, let me change my question. Okay. When uh, you open your phone to unverified features, unverified, my, I, mean, I mean by Apple, uh, before iOS 8, your phone would like say something that are not that really important, your location, your photos, maybe, some cookies or whatever, something like that. After iOS 8 or on new iPhones, you have your uh, money, kind of, your health information, your phone information, smartphone information. And if something happens to the jailbroken phone, there will be a huge publicity, a huge negative publicity toward the jailbreak, jailbreak community. Have you ever? Think about how would you change CDO or this kind of tools for iOS 8 or I so the question I guess really was about steal, not lose necessarily. It's about um, that on iOS 8, the, the ante has been upped on the security ramifications of storing things on your on your device. Uh, now, first of all, I will state that I've never stored those things on my phone, and yet I've always stored those things on my laptop computer. And we've never had this discussion about my laptop computer. You're going to start storing those things in your phone, and as, I, as will I, because I, I haven't upgraded iOS 8 yet. But we're, when are we going to have that discussion about my laptop computer? And in fact, that's what case in, uh, is, is essentially with uh, the uh, Chrome OS devices. You'll have that discussion about the laptop computers. Um, maybe not. OK. <laughs> I don't think you should have that discussion about laptop computers. But, but that's because, I mean, you're building a system that's securing the laptop computer. So I think that that's, I mean, I think that in a way, you are helping with that, that discussion. But, um, it's something where I, I don't, we have, we have existed up until this point with systems that are open. And we've had some high profile incidents of things get hurt. And yet, we still do not have very widespread, for example, like on Mac OS X, even though you can see it, you can see it slowly creeping towards having everything get controlled by Apple, I can still go to the store and buy Photoshop on a CD and put it in my computer and install it. I can still take that binary myself and modify it. I can still turn off the mechanism that allows me to only access things that have been signed, and even by the default setting, allows me to select who gets chosen. There is a setting that allows me to say Apple chooses, but it's not even on by default yet. We haven't had the discussion on my laptop computer yet. So I don't really understand bringing up the discussion on the mobile device if we're not going to have the discussion on the laptop computer. Um, on the mobile device, I will then make the argument that I think that your photos and your location actually are very important. And honestly, they are much more important to me than my credit card information. Um, I, my credit card information is actually this for a massive system designed in order to try to protect my credit card information, which is that if you actually steal my credit card and utilize it, um, who, uh, I get to say no. And I get my money back <laughs> as a merchant who has to give people money back occasionally um, by the system and does not have any issues at all with it. A lot of people are like, oh, wouldn't it be great if you use Bitcoin because that would be like the major reason why is you wouldn't have to do with chargebacks. I think chargebacks are important and interesting um, because they, they, they allow you to not care as much about the security of this, of this weird component of your system. I, I don't think that's different. Health, I do agree with you. I think there are a lot of things you can store in the health application that are scary, but I think a lot of people are already storing those in applications. So I don't think that's changed either. 
Um, it's, it's something where, um, and, and it's certainly, I mean, if you store, if you, I mean, here's, let me put it this way, logging in to a web page with, your, with, your, uh, with mobile Safari, typing a password into that, I mean, you have access, I mean, I, I do type my password into Safari for things like my health insurance information or any other online portals I have, if I go to like uh, Samsung Clinic or anything and I do any, all of that stuff. Like, I don't think it's changed. So, and we haven't, and we, it hasn't been a serious concern so far, so. Seems like there are no more questions. Thank you so very much.